Um, welcome to um, the Freedom Project and English Department's lecture today. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, James Simpson, Donald P. and Catherine B. Loker, Professor of English at Harvard University. A former chair of the Harvard English Department and co-author of a major report on the future of the humanities, James is one of the most important writers of his generation on medieval and early modern literature, and I think the most original and influential writer today on literary and intellectual history from the medieval period through the Enlightenment. It is not an understatement to say that he is almost single-handedly rewriting literary history. James is the author of six books of literary history and criticism, ranging from a study of Piers Plowman to his recent transformational Permanent Revolution, the Reformation, and the illiberal, illiberal Roots of Liberalism. He is unafraid to challenge the reigning orthodoxies about the arc of history from the Middle Ages through the Renaissance up to modern times, and to unmask hypocrisy, including even hypocrisy about hypocrisy. He is especially gifted at revealing how even modern practices rehearse the crimes of the past in the topic of today's talk, The Hammer of Iconoclasm. He teaches us how to look into the mirror of the past and recognize ourselves. But if James writes about the more unsavory elements of humanity, he is himself the most decent and most generous of humans. When I mentioned to fellow faculty in the English department that I had invited James, two of them who work in contiguous fields immediately mentioned ways that he had stepped out of his way to support and mentor them when they were younger scholars working towards a degree. He puts genuine effort into fostering human relationships. For many years, I've felt very lucky to count James among my own friends. He is a kind of emblem for, the, for generative sincerity and for the too often forgotten truth that when you assume the best of others, you will find the best. Please welcome the best, James Simpson. It's the end of term. We're all exhausted. We've been battered. One has to hear an introduction like that at this point of the year, Kathy. That's so, so kind and so very generous. I'm thrilled to be here, and uh, I feel very privileged to be invited to this forum. Not a word. You've all seen the images. They're from our own time, and they reduce us to silence. Objects from Mesopotamian religion, from Levantine religion, from Christian religion, from non-Sunni Islamic religion, all demolished. Everything that was different from the 18th century formation known as Salafist Islam, that form of Sunni Islam committed to replication of the first three generations of uh, Islam from Muhammad forward, all these artifacts had to be destroyed. So what's our first reaction? The first reaction of us in this room here right now is, I expect, my reaction when I first saw each one of these images coming up a reaction of horror on the one hand and of otherness on the other. I feel these are the true 
barbarians. I fall mute in my sense of horror before these images. But our job as scholars is not, however, to fall mute, to fall into silence. How might cultural history help us move beyond that plain, mute, appalled shock? How might cultural history help us to recover a voice? Might it be the case that we know what's going on right now, or very recently, and I'm sure right now, we know what's going on in the Middle East because we've been there before. Might it be the case that our horror at the images we've just seen, in its very intensity, itself has a history? We can understand the horror because our own horror has a history. Might it be the case that our own iconoclastic experience has taught us to prize the idea of cultural heritage regardless of the cultural tradition from which that heritage comes? Might it even be the case, the question that underlies my three previous questions, might it even be the case that we are ourselves, and certainly have been, possibly are right now, the iconoclasts. So those of us from a Judeo-Christian heritage, but by no means only those of us uh, from that heritage, those of us from a Judeo-Christian heritage have certainly ourselves been here before. Such acts are not, from the point of view of cultural history, remotely other. So rather than only recoiling from acts of iconoclasm, we might also practice what I'm calling cultural etymology. Looking at a cultural phenomenon which has become very familiar to us and scratching the surface, doing some excavation. And when we do excavation of those uh, well-worn, contemporary, everyday cultural experiences, and particularly if we're thinking about iconoclasm, our experience of entering the museum. Once we do this cultural etymology, this cultural excavation, if you like, we see where that experience comes from, where in this case the experience of entering the museum, the sense of sacrality that we feel as we enter the museum, where it comes from. It comes I'll be arguing from the fact that we ourselves have been the iconoclasts. But to practice this cultural etymology, we need to start some excavations. Where do we start such excavation if we're thinking about, for example, the destruction of the uh, temple of Baal in Palmyra? destroyed in 2015, where do we start the cultural excavation? Well, uh, we might notice that it's happened before. Uh, the second book of Kings, uh, referring to the reign of the iconoclastic king Jehu, uh, who lived in the ninth century before the Common Era, uh, destroys a temple of Baal, and it came to pass when the burnt offering was ended that Jehu commanded his soldiers and captains saying, go in and kill them, let none escape. The people who are about to be killed are the priests of Baal who are locked in uh, the temple of Baal. And the soldiers and captains slew them with the edge of the sword and cast them out. And they went 
into the city of the temple of Baal and brought the statue out of Baal's temple and burnt it and broke it in pieces. They destroyed also the temple of Baal and made a jakes or a, a, a lavatory in its place unto this day. So the temple of Baal has been destroyed. Temples of Baal have been destroyed before. But if we think about our own history, uh, temples of Baal have been destroyed much more recently than the 9th century uh, before the Common Era. At the start of our own modernity, I'm thinking of Amsterdam in 1611. What could be more early modern than for, for us? Amsterdam, 1611. Uh, there too, the Temple of Baal was the target. One Henry Ainsworth, uh, an Englishman who was in exile from England, uh, he was the leader of a Calvinist group called the Ainsworthians in Amsterdam. And the Ainsworthians were a breakaway group from the breakaway Calvinist ancient separatist church. So I think there are four levels of splintering there. Um, they're, they're a fractious lot, these Calvinists. And so as Ainsworth, leader of the Ainsworthians, uh, in 1611 writes his arrow against idolatry, this is what he says. He's referring to King Manes Manesse, who's the son of the iconoclastic king, King Hezekiah from the early 7th century before the Common Era. The, the Book of Kings, uh, Book of Chronicles, is a story of constant back and, and, and to and fro, back and forward between iconoclastic kings and kings who restore the temples and the idols of adjacent uh, cultures. So after the iconoclastic king, King Hezekiah, we have Manasseh. And his son, Manasseh, repeated all the former evils and added more unto them, if aught mote be. For he went back and built the high places which, he, which his father had broke down and set up altars for Baal and made groves and worshipped all the host of heaven and served them and built altars to them in the Lord's house and made strange and uh, made strange gods and caused his sons to pass through the fire and gave himself to witchcraft and charming and sorcery and used them that had familiar spirits. Now, Ainsworth's imagined destruction of the temple of Baal here is obviously an imagined destruction, uh, but it was actually going on if you will, in the iconoclasm of Catholic churches in Britain, to which we'll come in a moment, because for Ainsworth, as for all Protestants, polemical Protestants, writing in Britain about iconoclasm and idolatry from the 1540s forwards, for Ainsworth, Baal is code for the Catholic Church. So Ainsworth mounts his case against the Temple of Baal, a.k.a. the Catholic Church, through rehearsal of the narrative of the Book of Kings, which, as I said, is a story of constant filial backsliding. Back, back it's fathers and sons. Hezekiah, the father, might break the image that pollute Israel, but Manasseh, his son, reverts to the disgusting service of strange adjacent gods. Whoring with foreign gods is the phrase that frequently pops up in uh, the Book of Kings. Whoring with strange gods. The narrative of repetition has a characteristic twist, though. The repetition is always worse than the original 
idolatry. And so to refer back to Ainsworth's arrow against idolatry again, uh, we can see that uh, Manessa repeated all the former evils and added more un unto them, if aught might be. The backsliding is inevitable because idolatry for Calvinists is an addiction. It's an obsessive, pathological habit of sucking the milk of idol, idol I-D-O-L, superstition, unto which the tribes of Israel were, says Ainsworth, addicted. It's a kind of drug habit, this idolatry business. And so as soon as you get back to it, it's worse than it was in the first place. Idolatry is delicious. The problem with it is that it kills you. It is a bewitching sin, which as a harlot, whoring with strange gods, which as a harlot stealeth away the heart of man. Idolatry is also for Ainsworth, as for every Calvinist who's writing about idolatry. Idolatry is ineradicable. Citing Jeremiah 17 and unknowingly evoking Kafka, I'm thinking of Kafka's penetrating short story, The Penal Col Colony. Ainsworth says that idolatry was written with a pen of iron and with a point of a diamond graven upon the table of their heart. Idolatry is written into the heart with this painful uh, instrument, showing that the inmost affections are most deeply and continually infected with this vice and addicted unto it. So yes, we've been there before. Those of us from a Judeo-Christian tradition at any rate certainly know about iconoclasm. It's in our sacred texts and those of us who happen to be Cal uh, Protestants, uh, whether or not we're Calvinists, uh, those of us who happen to be Protestants uh, we are the children of the iconoclasts. We know about this from our kind of cultural DNA. So if we were to kind of stand back from the uh, periods of iconoclasm about which we know, uh, we might be well advised to try and distinguish the phases of iconoclasm, and that's what I shall do right now. Excuse me. Thank you. The phases of iconoclasm. I'm going to articulate six phases of iconoclasm. These are true of Reformation iconoclasm, the Reformation iconoclasm that happened between, in England, 1538 and 1644. But I think these phases apply also to other uh, phases of iconoclasm elsewhere in Europe, say the French Revolution, and elsewhere in the world, probably also to the, possibly, I don't know enough, I'm sure some of you here do, uh, about the Cultural Revolution in China between 1966 and 67. So um, I'm going to try and articulate what I call the kinesis, the movement, the interior dynamism of uh, the iconoclastic process. And I'm uh, out to articulate six classic phases or stages. The first is unlicensed iconoclasm, where not legislated, just people go out and start smashing images. No, we've got to keep this under control, says the government. We're going to legislate iconoclasm, phase two. Phase three, those images that are being broken, no, they're coming back again. They're coming back in different ways. They won't stay down. Both materially and mentally, the images are resurgent. But as soon as you have that, then, of course, we're back to the Book of Kings. We're back to to and fro, back and forth, wave-like motions between iconoclasm and resurgence of images, and then resurgence of licensed iconoclasm. It doesn't 
stop. This is a true instance of kinesis, of interior dynamism in a movement. So what happens after resurgence of iconoclasm? The main thing that happens is the iconoclasts are exhausted. They just can't do it. There are so many images out there. And so what do we get? We get an alternative solution. OK, we can't break all the images. Let's, let's what? what should we do with them? I know we're going to call them art. Uh, we're going to put them in museums. And we're going to make you pay to get into the museums so the credulous peasant um, who is likely to fall victim to idolatrous worship won't be able to get in. Uh, we're going to invent aesthetics, guys. We're going to have museums. We're going to have taste. That's, where, well, that's what we're going to do with the images. And then finally, there's no finally in this story. Finally, I say, we're going to have safe iconoclasm within the sacred space of the museum itself. So let us give some examples of each of these six classic phases, phases or stages of iconoclasm. Zurich, 1524, the image says it all. Here we've got the people up the ladders pulling the images down. We've got the altarpiece ready for destruction. Here, here's an image being carried out, and this is where it's being carried out too. Look, it's one of those um, different um, sequences of the image uh, re representing different uh, moments of the same act because it's the same figure carrying the same statue. Anyway, they're all being thrown into the fire, obviously enough. The most spectacular instance of unlicensed iconoclasm happened in the Low Countries in 1566, uh, you can see all these figures here on the left. They're all, they've all got ropes pulling down. They're in uniform pulling down the statues uh, of saints up here. Here is a figure up a ladder smashing a saint. There is uh, images, statues, uh, broken on the ground. This is the so-called Bildenstorm of uh, the Low Countries of 15. Uh, 66. Thus, uh, un, un, unlicensed iconoclasm. But as I said, governments don't like unlicensed iconoclasm. So what do they do? They say, OK, we're going to get this under control and we are going to take control. We'll order what images should be destroyed and what not. So in England, we have the beginning in 1538 after unlicensed iconoclasm in England, we have the beginning of uh, more than 100 years of iconoclastic legislation. England, more than any other country in Europe, experiences a longer period of legislated iconoclasm and a wider range of iconoclastic targets than, as I say, any other country in, uh, in Europe for the time, any other country in Europe full stop. Uh, in 1538, okay, all visible cult of the saints before their images was forbidden and all images that are abused with pilgrimages or offerings, ye shall, these are for, from directions to bishops, for avoiding of that most detestable sin of idolatry, forthwith take down and destroy. So it's those images which are abused with pilgrimages or offerings offerings for avoiding the most detestable sin of idolatry. It's only those images. The other ones that are not so abused, you can leave. Now, any lawyer can just drive a, a horse and cart through this, uh, through this legislation because how do you tell uh, which image is being uh, abused with idolatry and which not? And this problem becomes evident very, very quickly. And so by 1547, the last year of the reign of Henry VIII, in almost every place, this is by Archbishop Thomas Cramner, is contention for images, whether they have been abused or not. So, solution, it's simple. All the images remaining in any church or chapel shall be removed and taken away. And that statute 
is repeated in 1550, by which time we've got the young boy iconoclastic king, Edward VI, who says, under whose statute, uh, we read that Parsons, having any images, notice the legal language, of stone, timber, alabaster, or earth, graven, carved, or painted, shall deface and destroy, or cause to be defaced and destroyed, there's no let out here, the same images and every of them. That particular statute goes on to say that, oh, images of nobles and noble families, they're okay. Uh, we'll save the aristocrats and their images, fair enough. But all the religious ones, we're going to destroy them. We're going to destroy everything. And that legislation is uh, effectively in place until, as we'll see, the uh, 1630s. Uh, we can see this examples of this uh, legislated iconoclasm for the reign of Edward VI. Uh, in this image, this is the opening page of Fox's Acts and Monuments of 1563, the, the most popular book in English literary history after uh, Pilgrim's Progress you know, in the 19th century. Every household has this book. Uh, and if you look to the beginning of the real Reformation in England, Edward VI in 1547. The first page you see is this one. So here's the temple well purged, uh, a, 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 a temple, a church that's been stripped of all images, just two sacraments, uh, Eucharist and, um, oh, sorry, yeah, e Eucharist and, and baptism. And here in the top frame are the papists packing away their poultry. Uh, is the little caption it reads here. And so here's the church. Here is a statue being pulled down. Here's a fire uh, in which the statues are being burnt. And here are the papists carrying their trinkets, their poultry, uh, in their ship back to Rome. So thus the legislated iconoclasm. The trouble with legislated iconoclasm is that uh, you get resurgence of images. Images won't stay down. And you get two kinds of resurgence. One is resurgence in the minds of the iconoclasts themselves. And the other is resurgence affected by people who love the images. Two examples. The first, images resurging in the minds of the iconoclasts themselves. One Lawrence Humphrey, good paid up Calvinists. It's a real problem. The first period of iconoclasm was carnivalesque. It was great fun. We walked around with hammers, smashing the images. It was really great. We had a feeling of great solidarity. The trouble is the second phase of uh, that revolutionary uh, process is not fun at all. It's grievous because the gaps left by the material images are starting to grow back in the iconoclast's own mind. It's becoming a mental problem. If, says Humphrey, the idols are removed from the churches but steal into the mind and statues are erected in the heart, that is a defamation, not a reformation, a change of place, not a driving away of the thing, and so much the more dangerous because it, is, because it is interior and personal. So here's the iconoclast who's really starting to feel queasy. These images, I'm, I'm starting, to, my imagination won't be obedient. It's producing images. 1559, think of Spencer's Fairy Queen. Spencer is a paid up Calvinist, but the Fairy Queen is, just has images growing out of every crevice. But uh, in England, we had the people who love images also replacing the images. There, there, there are going to be lovers of the images, worshippers of the cult uh, who use images uh, in any situation where I, uh, iconoclasm is being practiced. So... I, uh, ecclesiology in the reign of Charles I, we're up to the 17th century now, Charles I from 1625 to 1649, under 
Archbishop Laud, who became Archbishop in 1633, Laud is, uh, initiates a process of beautifying the church, of restoring the actual images. So the resurgence of idols happens uh, in the 17th century. It also happens in our own time, if I could be permitted uh, just a little. Hi, Sarah. Very nice to see you. Um, th th thanks for making the effort to come. Um, we can see this resurgence in our own time. The Taliban, uh, as you know, in 2001, this was the first real episode of iconoclasm in our own times. You may remember it. Uh, I think it was February 2001. The Taliban uh, blew up this image of Buddha in this uh, gap here. Um, but as you can see, uh, the Taliban didn't do a very good job because when they blew it up, they left this great big gap. If they'd done the job seriously, they really should have destroyed the mountain because then they wouldn't have had the gap. But then, of course, they'd have the problem of the mountain-sized gap where the image really was originally. The problem with iconoclasm is once you start, it's really difficult to know when to stop. But even before, well before we get any, to any attempt to blow up the mountain, we get this, this really beautiful uh, spectral image, uh, Abamian Buddha produced by light technology uh, in 2015, the resurgence of the image, the resurgence as far as the Taliban are concerned, of the idol. So um, what's the next stage after the resurgence of the images? Predictably, it's resurgence of licensed iconoclasm. That's what happens in England. Civil war starting in 1642 up to 1640, well, up to 1660 if you want, and certainly up to 1649. Um, civil war, iconoclasm on a huge scale. Look, if you will, at the Lady Chapel in the Cathedral of Ely, all the heads have been smashed off. The first thing you go for if you're an iconoclast, if you don't have time, is quickly move through and go for the noses, number one, or uh, the heads if you've got a little, well, if you're in a hurry. Um, bishop Hall who was the Bishop of Norwich, who was imprisoned during the Civil War. What a work was here, what clattering of glasses. He's talking about the iconoclasm, licensed iconoclasm, 1643, licensed by Parliament, what was left of it. Uh, in, he's talking about the iconoclasm of his own cathedral in Norwich. Lord, what a work was here, what clattering of glasses, what beating down of walls, what tearing up of manuscripts, what pulling down of seats, what resting out of irons, and brass from the windows and graves, what defacing of arms, what demolishing of curious stonework, what tooting and piping upon the destroyed organ pipes. Images were not the only thing that the Calvinists were out to, to destroy. They also were wanting to destroy the music making uh, machines, the, the organs of the churches and cathedrals. What tooting of organ pipes, what hideous triumph on the market, market day before all the country, when in a kind of sacrilegious and profane pro procession, all the organ pipes, vestments, together with the leaden cross, were carried to the fire in the public marketplace. The greatest iconoclast, so far as we know, of the Civil War period is the charming William Darcing, who was responsible for 90% of the religious imagery of East Anglia between 1643 and 44. We know about this because Dowsing left a very precise diary, a day-by-day -day diary, 230 cherubim smashed today, uh, etc. It's all immense detail, and so we, we, we know what he smashed. Uh, interestingly, Dowsing, who was so keen to smash uh, religious images, was, was apparently rather keen to have his own image, not a flattering image to be sure, but his own image painted. And this is also the period in which iconoclasm starts to spread 
to other discursive realms. It's kind of transferred iconoclasm. After the execution of Charles I in January 1649, Milton is deputed to write a defense of the regicide, and he does so under the title of Iconoclastes, the iconoclast. So how so? Because Charles I has become an idol, and we've got to smash the idol, says Milton. And so he writes a book called Iconoclastes. This is where iconoclasm starts to spread, as I say, to other discursive forms. This is bad news because, as I said earlier, you can't break every image. For us, it would be like saying, you've got to destroy every advertising logo. Look, I can see one. Dell Computers. Uh, I, I, I'm sure. Oh, look, Lenovo. I've got, to, I've got to destroy that. This is really impossible work. These, these logos are really all over the place. That's the kind of scale of job that we're being asked to uh, undertake still in the 17th century, the middle of the 17th century, when we've been at it for 100 years and more. New solution needed. Plus, we are travelling, we, we Englishmen are travelling to Italy and discovering this really beautiful Italian art, which happens to be viable because the Italian economy is not going so well now and our economy is starting to rocket. So what do we do about these beautiful Italian Catholic images? We bring them back and we redefine them. We no longer call them religious imagery. We call them art. We invent a new space for them, the museum. That is the next of our stages, museum culture. So by uh, 1623, for example, we have uh, this amazing image of the uh, Archduke Albert and Isabella visiting the collector's cabinet in the Low Countries. So what's going on? We have the museum. Uh, we have a uh, Wunderkabinet with all the marvels, the strange uh, objects from the New World. Um, we have uh, broken images down here, just reminding us where these images come from. But above, uh, in the back wall, we have religious images. Here is an adoration. Uh, we also have secular images. Here's a, a, a um, uh, landscape. We have different discursive areas of art uh, just placed paratactically in a fairly randomish way on the wall. Um, it's the museum culture. It's not a church. All these images have been taken, many of them taken from the, the church and put in the museum as a place of exile and asylum for the image. But we can look, if we will, to what's driving the generation of the museum by looking to this image right here. Have you got my cursor here? No, you haven't. Um, th this image right here is a lovely surprise. It's the only image which is oblique to the picture plane of the whole painting. And when we do look to that image, image that oblique to this is what we see. We see an image of a representation of Iconoclasm, musical instruments, instruments of knowledge and mathematics, pictures, all being smashed by um, figures represented with animal heads. So uh, the uh, whole sh existence of the gallery is being underwritten by what drives it, which is the act of iconoclasm. And I think it's interesting in this image that we also see the first, what I take to be the first representation of the museum guard out here, because this is now expensive stuff and it needs to be protected. So we see um, the, the museum uh, being protected. Uh, a century later, we can see the same thing. This, this image happens to be in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, so you can go and see it, it's very close to here. Uh, this is the Duc de Choiseul, uh, who's the French ambassador to the Vatican in 1757. This is his art gallery, kind of fantasist art gallery. 
all of a sudden, uh, all of a sudden, Moses. This is uh, Michelangelo's Moses. All of a sudden, Moses is good for you, not because Moses was an iconoclast, which he was, golden calf. No, he's good for you because Michelangelo sculpted him. Um, this is aesthetics, and you've, Rome is now okay. It's safe. We can go to Rome as long as we frame it, as long as we look at the churches, St. Peter's here, from the outside, uh, and we can buy it. We can take it home as a souvenir. So we have museum culture, in short, as the solution. Uh, that, that was... Sorry, th these are these little images of... Rome that have been um, commodified. Um, now, the, the, the process that gets us this far is from, let's say, the 1630s, right, or really from the 1530s, right through to 1750. The process takes a long time to reach the museum. Uh, once we have different phases of European iconoclasm, the phase moves very quickly from iconoclasm to the museum. Look, for, for example, if you will, to Alexandre Lenoir, who became the first director of the Museum of Historical Monuments in France, who in the revolution itself is trying to stop the iconoclasts. You can see the uh, mallets being wielded here and here against the royal images of Saint-Denis, <coughs> just to the north of Paris. Um, so in the, the heat of the revolution itself, the person who will be the director of the museum is already saying, stop it, I promise, I'm going to move these statues out of the church and put them into a museum. The final stage of iconoclasm, the sixth stage, is what I call safe iconoclasm in the museum. Now, I know that the Museum of Modern Art I'm not, am I being in trouble by moving, by the way? No? Um, for, the, for the video? Um, I know it's been uh, renovated now, so it made it, it'll look very different. But when I made my first visit to the Museum of Art, now, you go up to the, fir uh, the first flight of stairs, and this is what you see. You see, for example, a Puritan church um, with white walls. This is a very Calvinist museum. And the very first thing you see in this Calvinist museum with all those white walls is a broken obelisk. A broken obelisk whose existence is, is very uncertain. It's all resting on this teeny little articulation here, but it's uh, an image of a destroyed image. Uh, it is safe iconoclasm in the museum itself. Abstract American abstract expressionism, a lot of it. Paintings of Ad Reinhardt, for example, black squares, are representative of that same iconoclastic activity, which has become part of museum culture itself. In sum, so far from it being the case that iconoclasm is over there, performed by the barbarians, we're now in a position, I think, thanks to our excavations of cultural etymology, to understand that we are the iconoclasts. Iconoclasm is a routine feature of revolutionary modernity. We are the children of cultural revolutions. We always destroy images in the name of the new revolutionary order. We might return to the grievous uh, destructions of uh, the Taliban in 2001 to underline that point about modernity, by the way. Here are the here's the uh, Buddha, the, the giant Buddha. Um, this is the, uh, a moment where it was blown up. Now, immediately after it was blown up, in early March 2001, we were... Uh, we, we could read this in the newspaper. The medi medieval Taliban were lashed over the Buddha demolition. Taliban militia was internationally lashed as medieval vandals of the world's cultural treasure. The Indian foreign minister condemned the Taliban's actions regression into medieval barbarism. 
wrong, wrong, wrong. This is not medieval barbarism, unless you count the fourth century. No, this is early modern barbarism. This is the Taliban as early moderns, not as, early, uh, as, not as medievals, but as early moderns. The Taliban were doing, ISIS are doing, what our early moderns did in the 16th and 17th century. They're the moderns. Um, they're moderns just as the Chinese students in the Cultural Revolution uh, thought of themselves as moderns, sweeping away the four old, you can see a little statue of Buddha uh, just there. Um, the, the, the Taliban are moderns just as European and early Protestants were and still are regarded as, I think rightly regarded as, moderns. Now, I could end there. If I'd been giving this talk only a few years ago, I would have ended right here. And I would have ended with two observations, the good news and the bad news. The good news is we get over it. It finally ends. The iconoclastic wave subsides. That's the good news. The bad news is that it takes 150 years if the 16th and 17th century or anything to go by. This is a long process. So that's how I would have ended. But history has overtaken us. We've entered a new iconoclastic phase, for the most part conducted by the left, but also by the racist right. This literal iconoclasm is producing instances of what might be called transferred iconoclasm. We've seen it already with Milton. We transfer iconoclasm of images to uh, metaphorical images, the image of the king. Literal iconoclasm in our own time is producing instances of what might be called transferred iconoclasm, whereby authors, for example, regarded as out of tune with what is judged to be uh, present probity, authors who are regarded as toxic, to use a word that's thrown around a lot, uh, those, uh, those authors should be banned from the curriculum altogether. Now, all of us, as I say this, will have our examples spring to mind. And the following will serve to trigger other examples that you will have in your own mind. You may have read about the Victor Arnotov fresco in George Washington High School in San Francisco, uh, painted in 1936, which the school council, first of all, voted to destroy um, because there's the, uh, this figure here, the, the so-called dead Indian here. Um, now, do you know about this? Yeah, you all know about it. I won't, I won't dwell on it, but it's, Anotov was a painter on the left. He's painting this in a critical spirit, but the school council decided that if a single student, I quote, is offended, then the whole thing must be destroyed. And thus they voted. They have since voted to, uh, to, to draw a, um, a, a veil over it. Um, and we've all got in our mind the, the, this, uh, the uh, iconoclasm, sometimes uh, vandalism, sometimes licensed iconoclasm of contemporary in contemporary America of Confederate monuments and of uh, monuments designed to memorialize uh, the victims of uh, white, white uh, supremacism. Um, so we can see this image from Nashville or the uh, second Emmett Till Memorial, uh, first erected in 2005 um, but now replaced by a fourth monument after subsequent vandalisms. So we're all living this intense drama. I'll end by asking you how we should respond to monuments. Monuments to an order, to orders, 
cultural orders, political orders that we now repudiate? How should we respond to monuments of those repudiated orders or monuments whose meaning might be judged as deserving of repudiation? Before opening discussion up in that way, let me recur once again to, uh, well, not, not once again, let me recur to three classic responses that our own past has to offer with regard to this predicament. How do we deal with the image which has been subject to iconoclasm? How do we deal with the monument to the old order? Solution one, I love this painting by uh, Peter Sandradam, uh, painted in 1628 of the church of St. Bavo in Harlem in Holland. You can still visit the church, it looks exactly like this. Sandradam's solution is simply to accept the Demolition of the images. This is a completely whitewashed medieval church. There's not a single image to be seen. There is one or two, actually, but they're so high they, they were out of the reach of the hammers. Um, you accept the, the destruction. You memorialize the destruction, but you transform the iconoclasm through art. The uh, artifact of the painting itself is saying to us, well, there's a new kind of art a rather haunting, spectral, melancholy, but I would say really beautiful art that is, is, is accepting the iconoclasm but not accepting the destruction of images. Here's a new image. It's, it's a strange, it's poised on acceptance and repudiation of iconoclasm. Here's another image by this brilliant painter, Dutch painter, Sanradam which is to leave the monument in place but mark it, mark it, so as to register the conflicted nature of history. You don't destroy the image, you leave it there, but, and you, you leave it there as marked. This, this uh, bishop here, Fran, interestingly, never existed, certainly wouldn't have existed in uh, 1638. In 1638, all the images, except the images of the nobles, had to go. Um, but Sandra Dunn painted in 1638, but he puts an image in, and this image never was there in the first place. Sandradam is, is reminding us um, by kind of faking it, as it were, uh, of what's gone. So he's, he's marking the image, he's marking the space, saying, remember what was here. The third classic solution is to put the stuff in a museum. And so here we have poor, poor, no. Here we have Lenin's head. <laughs> I don't think I could ever describe Lenin as poor old Lenin. Um, Lenin had detached for a 1970s statue, 1970s Soviet realist sort of uh, style. Uh, first buried, they buried this vast head in 1991, then excavated Taga in 2015, and then put in the Spandau uh, museum, a permanent museum in East Berlin. So that's the other solution. Just put it into the, into the museum. And let me finally end by asking what sort of criteria we might use as to work out which of these solutions, and perhaps you can think of other solutions, which of these solutions we adopt. What are the criteria by which we might make the decision to break or not, to preserve or not? Here are some criteria that, that I come, come up with and I'm sure you can think of others. Might we feel that leaving the offensive monument in place with added historical framing, that would be the Sanradam Bishop solution, leave the monument in place, he actually puts it in place where it never was, but leave the offending monument in place with framing that might we feel that that will serve the cause of deep reform better than simple destruction. We might also think about the future. We might feel this object is so offensive to us as to deserve nothing but destruction, but 
Um, what about others in the present? There may be others, as there were, certainly were in uh, Reformation England, who didn't feel that way about images. We've got to think about them, or do we? And also we might have to think about others in the future. Will they know what the past was like if we erase all reference, all representation of the past? Pretty much the same question, I guess. Are we prepared permanently to reshape the past so that the cultural landscape conforms wholly with our own present convictions? And are we prepared, finally, to make a distinction between that which is demonstrably offensive and or criminal and that which signals historical tragedy? Oh, actually, sorry, there's one more. Are we prepared to think about authorial intention or is the mere presence of a sign of the old order sufficient warrant to trigger the destruction? With the Arnotov images, I think we, we all feel pretty confident once we know about the history of that image, that Arnotov's intention was not to uh, slight the Indians, uh, the Native Americans, not at all. Um, but the presence of the image was sufficient to trigger a destructive impulse. Where do we place ourselves on that line? So with those solutions, with our contemporary predicaments, with our own history, and with those criteria for deciding on which solution we might ourselves adopt, I say, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I assume you're willing to take questions. I am willing not to take questions. Not just answers. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind answers, by the way. Uh, we've got one here. Thank you very much. Um, wonderful talk. I really love the, the, the kinesis model as well. It's uh, <clears throat> very relevant to all kinds of situations. Um, I have a couple, just one general question about the earlier part of the model, and then maybe a question and a comment about that raises some of the issues that you raised when you showed the pictures of the defaced monuments and the Confederate monuments. Right. And the, the first one is um, uh, it relates to the genesis of, of iconoclasm. Um, the, the sources of it. Um, this, the, what is the source, maybe a more general theoretical level, what is the source of the carnivalesque, the, the, the will to destroy? Yeah. And then the containment of it by licensure. Um, what, what happens between the, the more spontaneous kind of Bakhtinian carnivalesque iconoclasm and then the licensure? What are the, what, what are the mechanisms that take place in there in terms of notice and, and, and the politics of it. Is there any kind of temporal dimension or any kind of <clears throat> sociology of it? Excuse me, that's what I am, sociologist. But, yeah. Um, that, what happens in that gap between the emergence of that, that yeah. destruction and then the attempt to order it? And then I have another comment to that. Right. Point. Well, um, I'm no expert on the human psyche. Um, but it's clear that moments of carnivalist destruction are terrific fun. Um, think of the Chinese Cultural Revolution, more recent to our own history. Um, you know, those students really felt this immense sense of solidarity, of communal action, of the expression of righteousness as they were walking around with their hammers. Um, so, the, uh, the easiest, quickest route to uh, attacking the old order is to attack the representations of the old order. So iconoclasm is the first solution. Uh, and anyone can do it. You don't have to be learned to uh, practice iconoclasm. Um, and so it is characteristically the first thing that happens in revolutionary moments, you attack the old order by beginning to attack the images of the old order. Uh, as I say, anyone can do it. It's not, not a learned 
activity and the, the mood of Reformation writing between, in England, which is what I know best about, uh, between 1530 and 1580, let's say, is joyful. That's all I can say. It's just terrific fun. And it's also naughty. It's the fun of the buzz you get out of being completely improper and getting away with it. Everyone loves it. Everyone. No, not everyone. Some people. Anyway, that's, that's it. And what happens, you know, the, the governments don't like this. They, they don't want things getting out of control. They may agree with the iconoclasm, but this is a simpler answer. Can I just have one little yeah. I don't mean to, Please. I know there's a lot of people here, but I, I just want to go back and just suggest a theory about that, 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 that acknowledges the, dif uh, the difficulty of going from that, those periods to the, to the modern period. Yeah. Because what you have in the modern period, right, say now in the present day, you have a whole sphere of iconoclasm that doesn't take place in physical space. Right. It takes place in cyberspace, or whatever you want to call uh -huh. it. And you see physical manifestations. Of it. For every Confederate statue you see destroyed, there's a whole phalanx of iconoclasts that are pushing that on one side, and a whole phalanx of people who are defending it. And I'd like to just suggest a concept to think about that we may be in a state right now uh, by virtue of technology, by virtue of where we are in modernity, a perpetual iconoclasm. It doesn't have a beginning and an end. It just continues to cycle through culture constantly, which may actually be a source of our, our present crisis, is that there really is no unified idea of sacrality anymore. That's all I want to say. I thought I had good news and bad news. Yeah. I think after your brilliant comment, we have more bad news than we'd imagine. Sorry, it's late in the term. Yeah, because so. when you see this image, you think, I think, I thought, fantastic. We've got back at the Taliban. We've, we've recovered this image. But your, your uh, point that you've just so articulately made is suggesting don't get too excited about the new technology. I just so, wanted to add a little bit on, I mean, I was interested in what you're calling the carnivalesque, because my sense of the Bactinian carnivalesque was actually usually really inside yeah. already a system, like a Catholic church that, like carnival, literally, you know, where there's a kind of more orchestrated release that can yeah. get out of hand, but it's always pulled back. But sure. your sense, that I feel like that's not what you're really talking about. So the carnivalesque feels not exactly the right thing. You will note that I did not use the word Bactinian. Well, you said it. Yeah. <laughs> so, I said it. No, I think you did. Sorry, I, I, I interrupted. But, but, uh, but I think that this goes back to what Tom's saying a little bit too, that why this is really different. So if you're really talking about the Carnival-esque, and I, I think you did say Bactinian, but it's still the same sort of zone, that's a kind of more pressure valve sense of society. I think that's what that was about. Where you're talking about something where just there's no valve anymore. It's just the whole thing blowing up. Yeah. So I think that that's, again, sort of where one was this sort of carnivalesque as something to release pressure that only to be able to contain it again. Right. You're talking about kind of more volcanic eruptions yeah. that are uncontainable yeah. to yeah. a certain extent, even though you can then do some of these strategies to try to get around it. But I think it's really different from the sort of neutral yeah. sense of the carnivalesque. Yeah, thank you. I may well have said Bactinian because it's almost impossible to say the word carnivalesque without saying exactly. well, Bactinian and carnivalesque. Yeah. Um, I may have said that. No, I, 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 if I did, then I, in the face of your uh, absolutely accurate question, I would draw it because it's not. The Bactinian carnivalesque is part of the system, as you say. <laughs> you, you've true. said it. Um, this is not part of the system, and, and therefore, it's revealing, and perhaps a good answer to your uh, point, by which I'm totally persuaded, uh, to, to point out that it takes a long time. You know, the Bactinian thing, the, the Feast of Fools, is over tomorrow. It happens today. And, uh, and everybody knows it's going to be over. That's right. Everyone knows it's going to be over. It's just a period of provisional uh, world upside down. But the world upside down that we're talking about, uh, in this case, took 150 years. Um, whether or not we're heading into the same thing now, I, I, you'd know better than I. Um, I, th I think there was one question here and then Bob. Thank you so much for this wonderful talk. I would like to ask a question about the time frame, the yeah. bad news maybe. Um, do you see an accelerated 
time frame right now or uh, a fast history, uh, especially not in the United States, but maybe in reference to Taliban and ISIS. Because at the same time when uh, Palmyra uh, was destroyed, you know, that, that was televised, so we know what happened from the YouTube videos that they advertised. But uh, there also, there's also the other side of the story that ISIS was selling a lot of artifacts in the black market. And also around the same time, some governments in the Middle East you know, are arguing for a transformation of old museum churches again into mosques or, you know, like you, yeah. use, of, use of old sacred places, yeah. turn of museums into Fascinating. Again, so so all of these are taking place almost simultaneously. Almost simultaneously. No, and, and the black marketed artifacts are going to reappear yeah. somewhere in the West in the museums soon. Yeah. I'm thinking. So do you do you see this accelerated history or simultaneous events? I published a book, a very short book, on iconoclasm in 2010 called Under the Hammer, where I wanted the title to be a pun on under the iconoclast hammer on the one hand and under the auctioneer's hammer on the other. And one thing I did not talk about today was what you have raised, which is the auctioneer's market for images, which is uh, that little phase that should, uh, I think it's, uh, before we get to museum culture, which is phase five, we have stage 4A, or, you know, uh, which is the auction house, where the, these things are immediately going onto the market and they're, 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 they're commodified. So, um, and that is definitely happening, as you've said, with, uh, with the uh, ISIS destructions. Um, you talked about museums in, in ways that I hadn't uh, understood or I don't know about. Um, my hunch is that, you know, in the French Revolution, all the resources for protecting the images were there. The museum was there. Uh, it had been invented. So Alexandre Lenoir had, his, had the idea at the ready, the, mu the Museum for Historical Monuments. You know, they knew about it by then, and so it could be speeded up. But is the museum available anymore as uh, a kind of safe point of asylum for these images? Uh, do you know the answer? <laughs> Not really, but the example that I was trying to give was, uh, you know, in the Middle East is so common elsewhere in the Balkans as well, like mosques turning into church, turning into mosques oh, from like century to century. Right. Right. This, the, this, this is a common thing over there. Right. But now it seems more stable. Right. Now that we have <laughs> modern governments and everything. Okay. But there are still uh, some propositions. Um, the most famous by the Turkish president right now to turn Hagia Sophia, which is a museum right now, into a mosque, a mosque, a a, a mosque to yeah. be practiced in. Right. So the, the yeah. uh, revealing, repealing of the museum status. Right. So we're into stage seven, <laughs> uh, where the museum is turned back into a church and where the images, which we were going to look at in this sort of detached, uh, culturally tasteful way, uh, having paid our expensive entrance fee to get in, uh, the museums and their images are turned back into places of uh, sacrality. We can see that already in my stage five and six, museum culture and safe iconoclasm, in the museum, because those stages already are underwritten by the idea that the museum is a sacred space. It's sacred. It's our... The, the Enlightenment version of what is sacred. And, and that is the case because it smashed what was previously sacred and therefore has taken on the aura of sacrality mm. itself. So it just has to happen. You're absolutely right. It has to happen in the logic of our kinesis, that process, that we're going to have stage seven. I hadn't thought of that. Thank you. I think Bob was next. Like that kind of goes to what, what I was going to ask about. I mean, you're not suggesting that you reach stage six and everything's all tied up in a red ribbon and buttoned up and we're good to go forever. I mean, you're going to go back to stage one. Somebody's going to go in the moment someday and whack that damaged obelisk. 
my kinesis of iconoclasm is described in such a way as to put the emphasis on the kinesis. This is permanent movement. The image in Western culture, I think in all literate cultures, uh, is always dangerous. It's never a safe thing. It is always subject to fear, horror, uh, fascination, idolatry, the whole spectrum. So the kinesis never ends. And we've already worked out in this discussion, uh, we've already worked out what stage seven has to be, and it's predictable because it's in the DNA of the kinesis itself. So stage six, the, the rehearsing of iconoclasm in the sacred space of the museum must be the prelude to something else. You, you said you're not an expert on human psychology, but <laughs> is there any society or culture that, I, I mean, I just started thinking, is there some culture that hasn't gone through these phases? It just uh, seems like it's inherent in human nature. Middle East, you know, China, Europe, America. Uh, I, I, I have, my, my, I truly, have, I'm not an expert on human psychology, and I'm not an expert on global culture either. Um, but the places I've mentioned are places where it's happened, for sure. What about the moments of colonization, for example? The, um, you know, the Spanish going into Mexico City is like just the most bizarre sort of iconoclasm, iconoclasm, yeah. iconoclasm. I, I, I didn't mention that yeah. the, the history of colonial the, since the 16th century the is correlatively a history of iconoclasm. Wherever Europeans go, they start smashing the images. And this is true, interestingly, in paradoxical ways. The Catholics who are defending the image in Europe are going to South America. And, and the, there's a book about this, the, you know, massive iconoclasm. Um, so I didn't mention that because that's European, the European example just being foisted upon. Whether or not South American indigenous peoples ever practiced iconoclasm, I don't have a clue. Um, yeah. A, a terrific talk from the start to finish, a so provocative. There's one more dimension of your approach to the subject that I I find myself puzzling about. Mm -hmm. I kept thinking at any moment you would say, of course, there's another phase to this set of uh, this description, and it's when uh, people uh, stop smashing images and start killing people. The, the imprisonment, the torture, the persecution, all the way up to a genocide, maybe Maryland, when you even touched on it, when you mentioned colonialism, I, I'm just wondering, there must be some reason why you're not taking uh, your uh, a rich study of this, this topic into that whole other dimension of, mm. of, of, of violence against persons, the persons who believe in those images that you and I might, might worship. Maybe the next step is to put us, you and me, because we love to put us under the hammer. Does that make any sense? It makes complete sense. Yeah. I'm silenced by the gravity of the question. <clears throat> but uh, we do say, don't we, that as soon as you start burning books, you start burning people next. We start killing people next. Yeah, we can, um, on Crystal Map, we'll smash the windows that's right. and all of the objects that the Jews honor and treasure. Right. We'll s and of course, that's accompanying this yeah. tremendous <clears throat> genocidal impulse. That is the prelude to genocide. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I I, uh, I I I just I can't really respond to this question. I think it's totally plausible. Yeah. Um, but I wouldn't want immediately to say uh, it's tempting for me to say, oh yeah, that's that I could build that into stage three, three point five, right, right. <laughs> when we kill the people. And it is true that Milton says killing the king is an act of justified iconoclasm yeah. because the king is an idol. Yeah. So uh, the, the, uh, as I think about it, I, I do have one teeny little example yeah. of justifying um, a, a killing of a person um, in iconoclastic terms. 
Uh, yeah, I, I, I just, but I, I hesitate because this is serious stuff. Yeah. You know, you don't want to just say this suits my argument. I'll, I'll run with that. Yeah. Um, you'd, you'd want a whole lot of textual material that, yeah. that, that takes us there. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I don't have that textual material. My question's, I think, in a way too big, but it's just something. That yeah. We all might want to think about as we. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and the the crystal nut uh, example of iconoclasm uh, is 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 very uh, thought provoking. Uh, please. I, I kept waiting for you to, but you wouldn't because you know socialists go to social iconoclasm, which is what we're seeing in this country a lot, and the uh, the carnival atmosphere of you know neo Nazis uh, um, feeling power and. You know that young man driving into the protesters. You know, for him, you know that group of people were the icons of something that he hated. Uh, but through all of what you said, I kept thinking about the political reality that's going on now and the friction between um, blue and red. I think your example answers to the previous question. Yes. Uh, that was about an image, it was about a, a statue, and so correlative with trying to save a statue is killing a person. Um, yeah. I'm suddenly thinking, you know, the, the, this, uh, this question of kill, breaking the images of killing the person, you know, in medieval saints' lives, uh, the virgin martyr, it's usually a woman, um, in some of them, in Catherine, for example, the, the Roman tyrant says, I'll build you a statue. Mm -hmm. and she says, no, 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 I don't care about your silly statues. And by saying that, she knows that she's going to die. Mm -hmm. She's going to die of being executed mm -hmm. by, the, by the tyrant. So you know, building the statue or killing the martyr, killing the saint, making the saint, yeah. th these are options. I, I think you're making me think that in the material I do know, there is this resonance between breaking statues and killing people. It's one or the other. You've got to have either the statue or the person. You can't have both. Or the same. But as to contemporary iconoclasm, it's happening in all forms. It's happening by the right and it's happening by the left. Uh, and this is what really worries me. That um, you know, if, we're, if history is any guide, this is the prelude to, or it's an act of civil war itself. So, um, if history teaches us something, it's that breaking the images, removing them, destroying them, for whatever, from whatever side you're coming from, uh, you need to think about the, the end. You need to be careful about what you wish for. Because the, 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 the process, we've all been talking about processes, the process won't end with the destruction of the statue. It'll trigger further waves. This is very delicate and dangerous territory. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, you've had your hand up for a long time, sorry. Thank you very much. Um, if I didn't miss anything in your talk, you did not give a, pop, a, a definition of the notion of uh, icon. So, no. uh, so like, the, I mean, like, for instance, let's take 9-11 as an example. Mm. Okay. So basically, the, they did not attack let's say, the National Mall in D.C. They attacked uh, these two yeah. very tall buildings in New York City. Yeah. Uh, that's my question, a comment about uh, the second solution you mentioned. So basically, you just you know, keep the uh, icon in place, but frame it in a way that, you know, like the context itself gives you uh, a message yeah. that the icon was not supposed to, or was not meant to give in the first place. So as a follow-up, Hagia Sophia was a church converted to a mosque in the uh, like, uh, 15, late 15th century, but it was not enough for the Ottomans. Uh, one century later, 1550s, they built another mosque, Sleimani, around maybe 500 yards away from the Hagia Sophia. Mm -hmm. And it was just, you know, like not, uh, it, there were two intentions, I say, you know, like first one was basically to just build up, you know, a mosque as monumental as Hagia Sophia, second of all, but it was not you know, just framing, it was far away from Hagia Sophia, not yeah. just next to it. So, in a sense, you know, sometimes iconoclasm can just, you know, be very close to the second solution you mentioned, 
you know, and you know, I had difficulty to distinguish between those two. Maybe Suleimani most of us an act of iconoclasm uh, yeah. rather than a solution you know, to, to deal with the icon in the first place. Yeah, the fact that we use the word, uh, the term iconoclasm is itself interesting, isn't it? Because it shows that it comes from Byzantine, the Byzantine experience in the 8th and 9th century. Because um, this is obviously a Greek term, image breaking, iconoclasm. Um, uh, and it comes from not a, a, a a political or revolutionary, but a platonic background. You know, you've got to break the material to reach the uh, the ideal immaterial. You know, so there's a lot of iconoclasm in the platonic tradition itself, and in the way in which Platonism <coughs> comes into Christianity. Um, and then, of course, for us, the word icon has taken on a different meaning of exemplary thing. Uh, you know, movie stars are icons, or uh, the, the World Trade Center is, a, is, is an icon of American capitalism. Um, so, I'm not answering, your point was very rich one, I'm not answering it in, in its fullness. Um, but I'm capitalizing on this word iconoclasm, which I hadn't really thought about why we use that term, to, to reveal that the, the roots of iconoclasm are, are uh, of icons are even deeper, because they go to platonic philosophy, not necessarily theology at all. Mm -hmm. um, and they go to popular culture. We should, we should um, let you conclude. Okay. Um, I, I think, sorry, I know there are various people who have questions, but you, you had your hand up. All right. I, first of all, I just want to say this was an amazing talk. Um, it was really interesting because We've seen other Freedom Project speakers, and they usually make a very strong assertion. And what I really appreciated about your talk was that you kept very a, a very open perspective, and you didn't make a extremely like poignant assertion. And that was what was so like, incredible to me. Um, at the same time, I didn't feel very equipped to ask a question because everybody here is very smart and intellectual, and they have this like, incredible vocabulary that I lack, I think. And because of the openness of the conversation, I was having a hard time kind of pinpointing the exact question. But um, the last few speakers have kind of brought to light what I was trying to say in the sense that like, at the very end, the final slide with the various questions that you were asking to break or not to break, yeah. I think what was lacking was that, you know, who was writing history in the first place? Yeah. And as someone who, um, my parents are kind of like a product of colonization in the sense that like the Pakistan-India thing has had a major, you know, kind of influence in my life. So I like to think of things in the context of like who wrote history, who was in power, and if colonialism played some sort of part in it. Um, and I just think that this talk would be even more enhanced if you considered the, the facets of you know, who decided that Quite. we're going to use the term iconoclasm, which is, you know, yeah. Byzantine, which is in the end European, right? So um, maybe considering a little bit more of the influence mm -hmm. that, that Europe has had on all of this would be yeah. something that could enhance it even more. I totally agree. Um, and I think that one way I said I didn't have a chance to talk about colonialism, you know, this is a vast topic. Uh, a kind of world-making topic. The topic of iconoclasm turns out, I thought it started, uh, when I started out, I thought it was a, a subtopic of the Reformation. It turns out to be the history of the world. <laughs> it's a really big topic. And the history of colonialism from the 16th century is, is significantly a history of iconoclasm. And I think your point about who made the image at what point, for what reasons, this applies to the Confederate images. Exactly, that's exactly you know, right. Because they're not, they're not ori original, they're, you know, 1920s, they're sort of Jim Crow mm -hmm. uh, memorial. So that, too, has to be taken into account. I should put that in my list. Thank you. Kavi, I think you're telling us we should yes, stop. Yes, I think, I think you've given us a wonderful <laughs>